a metrics meeting. We have a packed agenda today. I'm going to encourage our speakers to keep an eye on the timers. And um, there will be times when we will cut off questioning. So I encourage you to find the people who are speaking afterwards so that you can ask them questions you want to ask them. Uh, we're going to be moving through this at a pretty brisk pace. Um, so we're going to start at this time with the welcomes and the um, anniversary celebrations. So I'm playing with celebrating different things. Sometimes we do birthdays, sometimes we do anniversaries. This month we're doing anniversaries, which I intend to do on a quarterly basis and see how this goes. And afterwards we have cake and lunch for this. So um, for the welcomes, next slide please. We have Doreen. Where is Doreen? Okay. We said hello to her last month, but we're saying hello to her again, and she's our fabulous travel coordinator. And we have Rod also joining us. They have the same last name because they are married, and Rod is um, taking up the Global Ed Program Director role again. We have Yuvi, who is a, now a fully hired rec member in India, and Ram, who is in Los Angeles. And then we have three new legal interns. Would the three of them please stand up? Where are they? There's one. <laughs> Just to put you on the spot, wave your hand briefly. We're introducing the legal entrance. So we have Missy Black, Megumi Yuki, and Ava Miller as the three. So go by and say hi to them. And then we have some new contractors. We've staffed up um, HR recruiting, which I'm very pleased to say. So um, Emily and Heather, would you guys please raise your hands? Emily's right back there. And I don't know where Heather is. I think she might be at an immigration training. Um, and then we have Runa in India and Shankar in India, also from engineering. So those are new folks. And I think a bunch of them are coming into town later this month. A lot of engineering is going to be in town in the week of the 25th. Right. So if you want to say hello to some of your frequently remote colleagues, uh, the week of the 25th, we're going to have a pretty full house in engineering. That'll be fun. All right, next slide. because we have anniversaries in January and February. So a lot of people are turning one, some people are turning two, Eric's turning five, and so is cool. So I just want to give a big round of applause to these folks. Um, for being part of the Wikimedia Foundation family. And I'm not going to read these, but I'll just let that linger for a couple minutes so you can see um, people's little milestones here. We'll move on from that. I'd like to invite Mariana up here so that Actually, we can... what? metrics first. Ah. Numbers. Numbers for the month of January um, and for the month of December. Uniques are at 472 million. Um, this is the December drop that we always see. Um, January page views are looking very good, though. Uh, we have a new page view record of 22 billion uh, for all projects combined. So you can see that in the last quarter, we really have been picking up in page view growth, especially on mobile. Uh, mobile crossed the 3 billion threshold uh, in January. Uh, so a really significant growth there. Um, for those of you who are using this tool regularly, you might want to find it handy that you can now get all this data uh, in table form as well, or get the uh, CSV download uh, of all these tables if you want to play with some of these numbers. Uh, we also have a new view of this data, which compares uh, some of the numbers against the targets for the fiscal year that we set. Uh, so this is the uh, view of the mobile page views uh, against targets and against projections. So just to explain what you're looking at here, the thick black line is the actuals. Uh, the blue line are conservative projections of what we think the rest of the year might look like. And the gray line is the target that we developed about a year ago. And um, so actually, we exceeded our conservative projections in January uh, and uh, are on track with regard to the target. But I suspect that seasonally, we'll get below the target again. Much of this growth that we had hoped for in page views on mobile uh, was intended to come from Wikipedia Zero. The numbers for Wikipedia Zero are not there yet. Uh, page view numbers for zero are pretty low. Uh, if we have time, Cool has a presentation and an update on zero. So uh, the zero gap, as we like to call it, is visualized a little bit more clearly in this graph, which shows you 
the MOBA projections against target and the RET here was the expected Wikipedia zero numbers and the thin uh, RET line is what we are actually likely to see by the end of this fiscal year. So the number of page views Wikipedia zero is unfortunately not a page view generating machine uh, just yet. So most of the growth that we're seeing in mobile right now is coming from organic growth and uh, increased adoption of mobile uh, around the world. So if you want to look at these targets in more detail, just go to reportcard.wmflabs.org, play with the numbers, and let us know what you think. We're continually improving this tool as well. Any questions on the numbers? So then, indeed, it is time for Mariana's presentation on mobile. Timer's right there with Pravina. So you may want to stand over here. Hello, testing. Hello. Hi. Mobile in January, that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, so I'm here representing the mobile web and mobile apps team, which is a new thing now. Um, can we uh, scroll through next slide, please? So just to recap, uh, last time I was here talking to you was in November, I believe. Um, we had thrown up a bunch of cool experimental contributory features onto our beta site, uh, which included editing, watch lists, reading lists, uploads. We were just trying to play around with lots of different ways to engage our, our readers to actually start participating. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> And how did we do? Well, here's an interesting graph. So this is uh, daily revisions on English Wikipedia. Uh, the red line represents visual editor alpha edits, and the green line represents mobile edits. Um, now, keep in mind that mobile is deployed on all projects, all languages, um, and visual editor alpha is only deployed on English Wikipedia. Um, but you can see sometime in January, we managed to overtake visual editor alpha. So you know, step up your game, guys. Come on, what's up? What's up? All right, so this quarter, um, what we're really focused on is uploads. Um, we started off January kicking off a big sprint on uploads. Um, and our goal is to get 1,000 a, a unique uploaders um, per month on Wikimedia projects. Big, big goal. Um, and for that, we have split out. We've kind of divided and conquered. Uh, we created an, a separate apps team to focus on apps for more experienced contributors. Um, and the mobile web team, which is still sort of focused on getting new people who have maybe never even contributed to Wikipedia at all before to upload their first file. So uh, mobile web, where we got in January, we were focused on three main features, um, adding an image directly to an article from your phone without having to go through the step of uploading to Commons and then adding the thing to the right. Um, donating an image to Commons, um, generically, not necessarily associated with any article, and um, a nearby view, which potentially, um, later on down the road, people can find articles nearby them that lack images. Um, and in order to show how this would actually work uh, in action, we have a short video presentation, which might work, hopefully, and not destroy the Hangout. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to just present, 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 present. Begins. What are you doing? I thought I was going to present that video from this. I don't need audio for this video. Yes. Oh, sorry, that was uh, wrong video. Wrong video. <laughs> okay, well. This is kind of a fast forward. I, I was still talking about mobile web, and this is for apps, but whatever, we'll go with it. Uh, this is just a demo of the Android app. Um, as I said, this is for more experienced contributors. We're imagining power users uh, of Commons will be able to use this to grab photos from their phone, upload them, um, hopefully down the road, as a batch process, uh, and be able to fill out a description, have a sort of standard license, We've polluted testswikipedia.org with a million pictures of Brian Viber's face in the process of this. Uh, and you can see it's, it's fairly simple to uh, fill out the description, do the license. That's all done for you. Um, and upload. Uh, you can also upload directly from your camera, of course. Just take a photo and upload. Um, and you get a nice little progress bar. Ta-da. So yeah, um, 
this is still all uploading to test Wikipedia, so if you want to play with these, um, they're, they're out there. Uh, I have a link somewhere down the road. <laughs> um, so don't worry about uploading weird photos, because they'll just be going to test Wikipedia through the apps. Okay, um, so that was the iOS app. We also have an Android app. Um, Is that the right video? Yeah. So this one, in addition to being able to upload um, photos from phone or camera, you can also uh, share share presentations and videos and things, um, which you will see. So this is just the c contributions view um, with the descriptions and the date that they were uploaded. Um, I think Brian is demoing taking a photo here. may have frozen. So same basic idea, you just fill out a short description um, and a title and you don't have to worry about selecting a license. Right now we're going with generic CCBYSA 3.0 for everything. <laughs> Scary Brian. Um, and I did want to show you the share thing. I think that's coming up right now. It's pretty cool. Only for Android so far, but... Um, so, Mariana, are there any plans to integrate this with the Wikipedia app itself? Or are these going to be separate, standalone I apps? think these will be separate um, for now. And I think we are going to try to drive people to apps to do uh, specific activities. So if they want to upload lots of photos, we want to make sure to advertise the fact that we have a Commons app um, on both the Wikipedia app and on the mobile web. So, um, but so this is nice, right? You can you can save a presentation and share it via Commons. Ta-da! Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Any other stuff you wanted to show on the video side? Uh, so I have the uh, the mobile web video, but um, we might just play that afterwards because it seems like the audio video setup is a little shady right now. Um, so, but I, I can show you some of the screen caps if you go back to my presentation. Uh, yeah, it should be after this. Um, so nearby, um, currently in alpha, it lets you see articles nearby you. Um, if you select one of those articles, uh, can we do next slide? Uh, and it happens to not have a photo, you can add one right now on your phone. It's amazing. Um, so this is the new sort of description preview screen. Um, again, generic CCBYSA 3.0 license, submit, success, done. Amazing. It's the future. Uh, and if, if you want to stick around after metrics, I'll show you the video of John demoing this, which I promise will be worth your time. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Mariana. Any questions around mobile uploading? Cool. Great. Awesome. Moving on, we've got Rowan up for a uh, visual editor in Parsoid. So I will summarize this presentation in three words before I give it. Um, the three word summary is Mariana, challenge accepted. <laughs> All right, can we full screen this so I have one slide per screen? Yeah, I was just saying why this isn't working. Yeah. Let's try. Try to view the PDF in something that's not a browser. Yeah. <laughs> you want a five? Yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, so, visual editor and parser update slide. Um, so, currently, as Mariana pointed out, we are running visual editor and parsoid as an opt-in beta um, on English Wikipedia only. Um, about 1,500 people have tried it, and about 1,300 uh, edits have been made with it. Um, we've generally gotten very positive feedback on it. It is, however, limited in what it can currently do. So, you know, it is an alpha. So we can do uh, we can do basic content. We can do like links and headings and bold text and stuff like that. But we can't do complex things like wow, 
we whatever we can do complex things like templates and references and stuff like that. Um, Parceloid on its end is doing a very good job in producing clean desks for pages that don't have all sorts of garbage that people uh, would get uh, angry about, but it still lacks some support for the things that we want to do in the future. Next slide. Um, so this is what Visual Editor looks like on a real English PP article. If you want to play with it, it's in your preferences under editing, enable it and click on the Visual Editor tab and just try it out. Next slide. Um, According to the roadmap, our primary objective by the end of June, which we say is the 1st of July, is to have Visual Editor enabled by default on almost every Wikipedia, which means that we have to work on all the languages, we have to work with Unicode, we have to work with input method editing, and um, if we're going to do, if we are to do non-Wikipedias, that means we have to deal with extensions that are like specific to Wikisource or specific to Wikibooks or all that kind of stuff. Um, and for it to be the default editor, we need to actually hijack the edit tab and introduce an edit source tab that lets you edit the Wikitech source. And of course, once we are the default editor, I imagine that little red line will go up a little bit. Uh, next slide. Um, we also have to, so first we have to not scrap what we already have. Um, we have to work on all content pages, which is something we don't actually technically do yet. We only do the name, main namespace right now. We don't do stuff like the portal namespace and other content non-main namespaces. Um, we have to make it so that you don't have to opt in to use it. You have to not be um, like a technical wizard to be able to use it because it's meant to be a simpler editing experience, not a more complex one. Um, it has to not like screw pages up and produce ridiculous wiki text diffs. We need to actually have user visible progress, so we need to be able to edit more. And we want to make it work in Internet Explorer, which, as you probably know or suspect, is a pain in the ass. Next slide. Um, so things that we need to, new things that we need to do. We need to be able to edit and create what we call basic content, which we mostly already have covered, um, except that we don't really have images done yet, which is something that we're going to do in the next six months. And uh, in order for content to actually be able to actually be acceptable for inclusion in Wikipedia, we need to be able to do references because if things aren't on site, the community will delete them. And in order to do references, we need to be able to do templates because most references just contain a template that produces citation. Um, we also need to do categories because uncategorized things are similarly hated and deleted. Next slide. Um, if we have time, which we probably won't, um, we would also like, and probably won't, uh, to do the following things, which is support definition lists, which, which, is, which we've just been putting off. Um, importing and uploading things from outside of Commons, um, support templates beyond like the simple ones that are current references, and do things like language things, redirects, TUC suppression, all that kind of like weird stuff that you can do uh, that's sort of similar to categories and technical nature. Slide. Um, this means that the following things are things that we're not going to pay attention to. I'm not going to list them off because there's too many, but tables and parser functions are really great examples. Um, they will render the way you expect them to, but you won't be able to like fundamentally edit them. So for instance, on a table, you will be able to see and edit the text inside the table, but you won't be able to like merge two cells or like alter the structure of the table or do anything like that. Um, next slide. <laughs> The major tasks that we have on this for the visual editors section, for the visual editor side of things, and Parcel will be in the next slide, um, we have to have a references editor if people are going to insert cited content. That means we have to have a template editor because the content of references is usually just a template. Um, that means we also have to do parameter hinting for templates. Um, furthermore, we need a categories editor. We need a image insertion thing, which is more generally described as a media insertion thing because Wikia wants to do video as well. Um, we need to make sure that input method editing actually works, which I think is theoretically supposed to, but we haven't actually tried in putting Japanese characters in there yet. Um, and we need to support Internet Explorer. Um, we're also doing some stuff on the behind the scenes with rewriting some infrastructure, and hopefully we're going to do automated browser testing at some point. Next slide. Um, the stretch goal here, stretch goals here are to have generic template editing for more than just simple templates. Um, that's a stretch. Um, being able to upload stuff from within the media insertion widget, also a stretch. Being able to do definition lists, 
being able to switch back and forth between Wikitext and visual mode without saving in between. Um, also non-trivial, we're hoping to get it done in the next half year, but we may not. And we're looking into coming up with a micro visual editor within the visual editor for editing edit summaries and image captions and template parameters and stuff like that. And yes, that means you will have, you will potentially have editors within editors within editors within editors. So you can do inception within visual editor, it'll, it'll be great. Next slide. Um, the major tasks from the parsoid end are mostly centered on supporting editing the things that we want to be able to edit. So like references, templates, uh, tag extensions, or things that we can't edit in the visual editor right now, but parsoid also doesn't support editing of them. So uh, Parso needs to implement that as well. Um, for to support non-English wikis, we have to know that file colon is really build colon or datai colon in German, and you know for all their 200 languages. So Parso needs to support those things. Um, they are also going to look at uh, the Parso team. That is, they're also going to look at uh, doing round trip testing on non-English pages. Um, doing like incremental reparsing, such as only bits of the page are reparsed, uh, generating and storing HTML on edit rather than having to generate it every time, a bunch of optimizations like that. Next slide. And if we have time, um, there is going to be some uh, research done into having wikis that will have only HTML from the get-go that will never ever have wiki text. And that means that there has to be some way to do templating in that language. So there's all, this is all like an experimental research area that, the, that Gabriel and his team are uh, going to be do some, doing some research in either, either this half year or in the third quarter. Next slide. Um, so in summary, what you will hopefully be able to use on the English Wikipedia as a default editor on the 1st of July, 2013 is an editor that can do things that will not get reverted, which means that you have to have citations and lists and categories and all those things. Um, a parcel that can cope with all the things that we have to support from part one, and it can actually scale to handle all of the edit volume across all of English Wikipedia. Because if the red line is going up a lot to the extent of like the XKCD comic about log scales, then you know parcel is gonna uh, need to be able to deal with that. Um, we're going to have an integration where the edit button becomes the visual editor and there will be an edit source button and that will be live on all language Wikipedias and maybe also on Meta and Commons. And finally, we need a way for editors to add metadata to templates about the parameters that, they, that, the, param that the templates use such that visual editor can actually intelligently do parameter hitting. Next slide. All right, we have 40 seconds left, so I will probably be able to take one or two questions. Uh, yes, S and then James. Um, what happened to the uh, parser in C++? Is it still the JavaScript thing? Um, from what I understand from Gabriel, uh, yeah, so it's currently still in JavaScript. From what I understand from Gabriel, um, they're not currently planning to do a C++ port because they expect to be able to squeeze enough performance out of the JavaScript implementation that it won't be necessary. Um, but they will like reevaluate this in quarter three or four and then possibly do a C++ implementation. Um. Gabriel um. had raised his hand, Ron, if you wanted to, I think, elaborate on that response. He's got part. his MS. Well, I just wanted to uh, append to that, that the long-term plan is to basically part, don't parse at all. So we want to store HTML and just read the HTML and serve it. And so we don't really need such a super fast parser because we don't want to parse anymore. I had similar questions because before it goes, um, goes to default it has to be a whole lot faster than it is now. I just stopped using it. Um, so the idea for tables at the moment is to do that way past July. Um, yes. So tables are not in the roadmap for the first half year of 2013. We're going to be able, we're going to have to tackle them at some point. Of course, um, the current state, as I said, is you can edit the text in them. You can't modify their structure. Um, eventually, we intend to work on a table editor, but that in itself is a really hard project. Like table editing in any existing program sucks, and we're, it's really hard to design something that's actually properly usable. Thank you so much. We are moving to Sumana. Mm -hmm. Sumana is going to present remotely. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> 
everybody. Um, so I am Sumana Harihadeshwara. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am the engineering community manager for the foundation. I've been here for about two years. And so today I'm going to be talking about the outreach program for women. Mm -hmm. So if the Wikimedia gender gap is terrible, uh, then the w media wiki gender gap is even worse. Uh, last I checked, I, I don't have exact numbers, I believe we were approximately 5% not male. Uh, I've been here two years, I tried doing a lot of things. I tried having us speak at women's colleges. I tried inviting women to in-person and online events. Sometimes this got some momentary interest, but it did not budge the needle on the number, the proportion of women in our open source community in the long term. So I looked at a program that was actually successful in a different open source community in moving the needle. The GNOME open source project did paid internships with mentors. This was uh, done for several rounds over the course of several years where various women got three months of paid work paid US $5,000 and in, after several rounds of this, this ended up raising their yearly conference attendance from about 4% women to about 17% women. Then they'd actually move the needle. So when they became an umbrella project and started bringing in other open source projects it, to do these kinds of paid internships, I got Wikimedia involved and Kim Jill in my team has been administering this for us in the first round, the current round that we're basically in the middle of. We have six women to our open source projects. Design, code, community management, documentation. And there's a link here uh, where you can see more about what each of these women is doing. And there is a blog aggregator, uh, the Planet Women in Free Software, where you can read the blog entries of women in this internship program for Wikimedia, for GNOME, and for the basically dozen other open source projects that are also participating as mentoring organizations. Next steps. Uh, I need to continue to follow up and we need to follow up on the successes and the experiences of our existing six participants. The, you know, it doesn't end at the end of March. There will be another round that we aim to participate in this summer participants would apply to participate in April the, to get internships and so we'll be spreading the word about that and I would like to find some sponsorships because most of the money for these paid internships came out of my budget in this round and it would be great if we could get some grants or other additional budget for this from perhaps some for-profit organizations as happened for a little bit in this round. Uh, are there any questions? I don't hear any questions. Am I missing something? It's a quiet crowd today. <laughs> okay. okay. Go ahead. I've got a mic. That's all yours. Great. Thank you, Simona. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start playing your slides as a YouTube video like you requested, Terry. Let's see what happens to the people on Hangout when I do that. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Oh, it's on mute. Uh, it on? Hello? Yes. OK. So what I want to do is just provide a framework to understand what Features Engineering does at the foundation through uh, 10 evil things. Uh, the only caveat is, is it's a five minute talk, so I have less than 30 seconds per evil. Uh, I, what? I, I usually begin uh, my talks but with an introduction of who I am. Um, and I used to work at Plaxo and Tagged, and I, uh, whoa, what's going on there? Hurry. Plaxo and Tagged, and uh, I may have learned a thing or two about evil in that time, uh, given the, this article. Okay, is it not working? What's going on here? I think you know? the combination of trying to broadcast this live via YouTube while playing it from YouTube 
may not be ideal. Well, and then just go to the slide share. Sure. And I'll just say when the next slides are. Try this okay. Again. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay. So uh, luckily, Eric and Sue, in their infinite wisdom, decided uh, to keep me from directly doing evil and made me a pointy here boss, uh, which gets me to my first evil, which is middle management, what I am. Uh, and next slide. Like anyone evil, I can't act directly. Instead, I have to act through my minions. These are the, the four uh, major teams of features, and I'm going to be t explaining what they do in the white slides, so watch out for them. Next slide. Uh, the first, the reason that motivates all of us in features, as you know, it's the oh shit graph. And all of you are already familiar with this, so I won't bother explaining it. Next slide. Uh, instead, I want to give a different perspective on this. Um, in, uh, in cosmology, there's this concept called heat death. Basically what happens is the universe will burn out or exhaust all the usable energy and you have the heat death of the universe. So what the oh shit graph means is basically if we don't do something about the editor retention problem, we're gonna, uh, the inertia is going to uh, burn out all the active editor in energy in Wikipedia and we're going to have the heat death of Wikipedia. Next slide. Okay, so how are we going to do that? The way we're going to do this is with affordances. Uh, affordances uh, are qualities that enable discovering actions without thinking. If I show you a light switch, you know what it is without thinking. But there's the same thing on the web, whether it's a search box with a magnifying glass or a bookmarking affordances like uh, this like but, uh, button on Pinterest or, or wish lists on, on Wiki. Um, in fact, they can get quite advanced, and there's a video there that you can't see of uh, failed uh, login on WordPress. Next slide. Uh, when you consider how this interface goes uh, to our editors, what you normally see is a uh, thing that you can't see here, but uh, the uh, normal interface. This doesn't resemble modern uh, affordances at all, like on WordPress or on Google Docs. The visual editor and Parsoid teams in features are trying to update that affordance because uh, this visual editor is the alpha of all editor interaction on the site. Next slide. Uh, to further understand what we're trying to do here, let's talk about habits. In the power of habits, uh, basically Charles Duhigg talks about habit loops uh, with a Q routine reward cycle. Uh, Note that uh, in his thing, when he talks about these things, whether it's about alcoholism or exercise or gaming on social networks or paid patrolling on Wikipedia, there actually isn't a real loop here. Uh, it, it, the rewards do not cycle back to cues. So what are we going to do that? Well, for next slide, let's talk about a real loop. A real loop is like the viral loop here, uh, the viral growth curve. And in that, um, you have this concept of the funnel. Uh, using uh, Hotmail, the original site as an example, you have this uh, viral link there. So a user signs up, sends an email, someone else reads the email and maybe clicks on the link and then signs up. So that's the loop there. And how do you get viral growth? Well, between sending and reading, there's a lot of people. So you have a multiplicative positive impact. Uh, a feedback. I don't say impact in the case of Hotmail. Um, next slide. Uh, so how does that apply to habits? So this is almost unreadable, so I'm just going to explain it. Uh, when it applies to habits, it's known as gamification. Uh, in social games, uh, basically what happens is there's a queue. The user sees some sort of social queue, which reminds them to check their crops on Farmville. They do their routine, which I assume is uh, clicking on some random stuff. Um, and then uh, they, they get a reward, and that's to brag about how awesome their crops are on their social network. The difference here, and the reason it's a loop, is that um, basically the, the, the reward that they get becomes a cue for a, nut, a different user to uh, check their stuff on Farmville to modify their crops and brag about it on social network. Do you see how there, there's this positive feedback loop? Um, but in this case, you're in, unlike virality, you're multiplying user time spent on site, not uh, the number of users. Next slide. So how does this apply to features? Basically, in time spent on site in, in, in the web is known as engagement. And what the editor engagement is trying to do is install those levers that allow these habit loops that Wikipedians already use when they do page patrolling or other things to, uh, to create such that uh, the levers, such that there's a positive feedback loop, such that the, the rewards that one Wikipedian has generates a, a, a cue for another person to interact socially in the site in a purpose-driven manner as opposed to like generating more clicks. Um, so next slide. And that, so, uh, but uh, when do you pull the lever? 
Well, let's go back to this viral marketing sort of concept. Have you ever thought what the difference is between word of mouth marketing and viral marketing? Next slide. Whenever you're in the viral loop or in gamification, unlike uh, the real world or meat space, uh, every step in the funnel can actually be measured. This is called A-B testing. So next slide. This is what experimentation is about. Whether we're literally talking about measurement in the case of event logging, or we're talking about these features like post-edit feedback or account creation or onboarding or guided tours, uh, you now understand what the, the experimentation is doing in terms of terminology we just learned about, whether it's cues, affordances, or the funnel. Next slide. Which brings us to the features last team, which is uh, a big thing. You see graphs like this, and it's like pretty impressive, a $2 million day and everything like that. But the numbers don't mean anything by themselves. The importance of the numbers in the fundraising group is that it made the fundraiser shorter, more efficient, and lower impact. That's a qualitative measurement, not a quantitative measurement. Next slide. So this is what I'm talking about. Uh, basically, the big difference between us and the commercial world is all they care about the quantity. In the, in the big case, the quantity is money. And in our world, uh, when you look at our vision statement, each one of those quantities is just a proxy for a larger qualitative measurement that we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to freely share, for instance, instead of spend time needlessly on the internet. Or improve the sum of, sum of all human knowledge instead of generate piles of cash. Next slide. So how do we accomplish this? I can't show you this video, but it's a video of Boston Globe. When you resize bostonglobe.com, it's responsive. What that means is as you, whether it's on a desktop or a mobile, a mobile device or a, a, a tablet, you, the, the single design will accommodate all formats. And that is like an inspiration of how to do things because it's not automatic. It Basically, the site is responding and it's not reacting to the user action. Next slide. And so that's an inspiration from the mobile world. And this reminds me of Victor's story at Wikimedia. He talked about his first actions at Wikipedia being to vandalize the site multiple times and have it reverted. And he's like, wow, this is unbreakable. But when you listen to the story, it, uh, notice like what Victor was doing was not timid. He was actually being bold. And how it was fixed is not because a bunch of policy was in place, but because the system was in place to empower the community, not act as an obstacle, and in a, a, a manner that isn't a bunch of bots, but is responsive to the system. And that's how features engineering wants to work. It wants to create bold systems that empower the community to be responsive, not reactionary. Final slide. So I hope this explains 10 evil things and how it relates to features engineering. Uh, who I am, I'm a PHB. Uh, why we're doing this, because we want to avoid the heat death of Wikipedia. What we're trying to do at Features, we're trying to build the affordances, discover the habit loops, and uh, to create positive, uh, uh, positive feedback through the system. Where we're going to apply this through, uh, through the principles of gamification or, or viral marketing. When we, uh, when we to install those levers, when do we uh, pull those levers based on A-B testing, but with the qualities of quant quality over quantity, and how we do that. Uh, through responsive ideas. Thank you very much. Any questions for features engineering and their evil plans? I really try to avoid a Dilbert-esque environment here, FYI. <laughs> All right. Great. Who's next, Gail? Um, we have Sika, but there's one question. Um, hey, Terry, uh, I had a question from IRC, which is, what is the difference between responding and reacting, or is there none? Yeah, we've got that one. Basically, in re responsiveness or responsive design, you're, you're building the system that is, is basically uh, responding to the user action. So in, in this case, you're putting the processes in place or the systems in place or in the case of engineering, the software in place that responds to the thing. You're not actually like building a robot that like undoes things because you're, you're trying to work with and empower the vehicles that are already in the system instead of create these new automatic machine vehicles or whatever. Thank you. All right, Seiko. This is on. Do you want to do stuff? No, it should just be on. Eric, Heather's going to drive the demo sure. a little bit. Should be on. <laughs> Can we start at the bottom, Heather? 
So I don't know. Yeah, hold on. I, need, I should have practiced first. Speaking of introducing yourself, it has kitties. Introducing. Hi, I'm Seiko Bouters. I uh, am in the grant making team, and we just launched a new grant making program this month that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the lovely Heather Walls over there is going to drive a demo of uh, a page that she designed. Uh, so, new grant making program, it's called Individual Engagement Grants. Um, these grants essentially support community members working either alone or in small teams for six to 12 months to complete projects of their own design that do something to improve Wikimedia projects. Uh, we're shooting for community improvements, we're shooting for online impact, things like that. Uh, the open call for proposals in this round runs until February 15th, so I'll probably be up here again in later months telling you how that went. But what I want to do right now is show you something that we built to solve one of the problems that, that, um, that we thought about when designing this new program. Uh, and the problems are, A, that applying for a grant, really applying for anything, can be intimidating. Um, and then B, oftentimes people have ideas but need a little bit of help turning those ideas into project plans or grant proposals. So we've made the Idea Lab, which is basically, uh, yes, it has science kittens. And uh, it's designed to be sort of a fun and playful space to get people to share their ideas and help each other improve them. Uh, so the first thing you can do in the lab is you're invited to share an idea. And uh, basically, we walk you through a really simple process to start an idea. And because we're sneaky, the outcome of that is um, essentially a stub for a grant proposal page. Uh, let's go to the next section. Uh, so then we invite everyone to pitch in and improve ideas. So we're surfacing new ideas. We're surfacing grant proposals in various states of being drafted. Um, and why don't you open the second new idea in there just to yeah, just to give folks an idea of what a proposal stub looks like, this is what it looks like. Uh, so Jane has an idea for a project to work on contests. Um, and if you look at the talk page, you can see that, uh, that staff and volunteers are kind of diving into the discussion with her to see um, what we might do to think about turning it into a grant proposal. Let's go back to the lab. Uh, and the final thing that we're doing is inviting people to introduce themselves. Um, basically, you know, we think that surfacing real humans helps foster collaboration. So um, anyone who's hanging out in the lab can create an introduction. And one of the things that we're doing with these introductions is inviting people to share what their skills are, you know, sort of what, what they can help with in the lab. Um, and we just added 15 uh, volunteers to the committee list that will help select these grants. And so you can see some of our committee members are starting to create their profiles. That's it. Any questions? All right. Great. Quiet Quiet to see back to the lab without saying to see what's on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I have an agenda change, so we're going to call up Philippe next. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, while Eric gets mine up, I'd just like to point out to Terry that my initials actually are PHB. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Um, so this is, I'm, I'm to talk about what the community advocacy part of the, the legal and community advocacy team does. So right now that's um, Maggie and me, um, but we're growing out that team. So next slide, please. Uh, I thought it would be easiest if we talked about what I don't do. Um, this is what my mom thinks I do, uh, <laughs> science-y stuff. Slide. Uh, this is what the ARBCOM thinks I do. Um, I'm just buried into paperwork every day. Slide. Uh, this is what our legal interns think I do. Um, they're pretty close. Slide. Uh, this is what Jeff thinks I do. <laughs> Slide. What I think I do. Um, like what many of you think you do. Um, but what I actually do. Uh, well, this is what the staff thinks I do. Most of you have no idea. Um, but uh, let's go on. Thank you. Um, what we actually do. We have three core initiatives in community advocacy. The first one is to support our non-English speaking communities. Um, we spend a lot of time, all of us, interacting with the English Wikipedia. Our goal is to find voices um, from non-English speaking communities that we don't hear from 
So we're going to do things like translate summaries of critical initiatives, um, for instance, the legal fees assistance program, the terms of use refresh that we did, uh, and then we're going to monitor discussions and then summarize them back to the people who are running that, that initial discussion so that the voices of those non-English communities can be heard as policies are being developed. Next slide, please. Um, the second of our three core initiatives is to identify and learn from top Wikimedians worldwide. So we're looking for people who are, um, who are leaders in their wikis that we maybe wouldn't know about. So on the non-English wikis, we're looking for the people who are, uh, for lack of a better analogy, they're the risker or they're the New York grad of that wiki. Um, we want these people who really are growing out leadership and we, know, we need to find out who they are and, um, and uh, develop relationships with them. Next slide. And the last of our three core initiatives is to build a small diplomatic and multilingual team of community advocates. These guys are not just translators, although I mentioned there would be some translation happening. They're going to be volunteer coordination. They're familiar with the communities, and they're able to step into difficult situations and give us context. So if you come to us and say, um, we're going to roll out this thing on the Japanese Wikipedia, what do we need to know? Well, we're not going to know all the answers, and we're going to be mostly right because we're still learning. Uh, what we're going to be able to do is help connect you to the people who do know um, because we will have identified who the leaders are in that. Um, so the idea is that by doing these things, we can help the foundation roll out um, critical initiatives in a healthy um, and supportive way, knowing who the leaders are on these non-English wikis. And we have some, some target wikis that we're starting with. Um, if you'd like more details on those, find me later. I'm happy to um, talk to you at great length until you're ready to shut me up. Um, so uh, that's what the community advocacy part of the uh, legal and community advocacy team does. Are there any questions? We have one minute. In the back? Sorry, slide come. Do we use Translate Wiki as a, for translating documents? What we've done so far is use the Translate extension and also um, just some, in some of the other Wiki-based tools. We've not used Translate Wiki yet which also wouldn't make a lot of sense for documents because yes. it's software localization, but you guys use the uh, meta uh, translate extension yep. right, for all your yep. translation, which is the same software. Yep. Any other questions? Yes, please do. If there's anybody you know that would like to be uh, either a volunteer or who might be interested in coming to work with us, we have some positions posted right now. Um, I've got one guy we're interviewing tomorrow, um, but uh, please do communicate or, or get them to get in contact, contact with me or get me their stuff and I'll get in contact with them and ask them. Um, but we really want to get some local volunteers into the office who can help us understand some of these other language wikis as well. And if they're not local, we'll work with them remotely. Maggie's uh, really good at that. Yes, and Jeff is pointing out to me that we're looking for people where this is mother tongue capacity to them. We don't want somebody who's done two semesters of French. We want somebody who really speaks French. Step into the lunch later. Anything else? Thank you so much. And I'd like to invite Cool up. So I just wanted to give everyone kind of an update on where we are with Wikipedia Zero. Um, We've had a lot of things you know, in development over the last few months, and most of the launches we have done have been pretty small. So probably here on out, we're going to see start seeing bigger jumps in usage. So I want to tell you like what we've learned so far and where we think we're going over the next few months. So as of um, a couple weeks ago, we now have access to 330 million subscribers. And that includes Vimblecom, which will give us access to at least 100 million more. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that number really means because it sounds like you know it's a lot, but there's so much more work that needs to be done to really reach those people. Cool. Just the, the five second version of what zero means to these okay. 330 million. So in case you don't know, zero zero basically is um, zero rating, which is free access to Wikipedia on mobile devices, and particularly in developing countries, which we're targeting. And there's two versions of it. Zero, um, the flagship zero version, actually is a text only version. But we are working with some partners to actually zero rate the entire mobile site. And just to continue on, right now we are deployed in 11 countries. A 12th country, Botswana, um, is in deployment right now. And what we're seeing right now, I mean, it takes us a few months to kind of see some traction. But once it starts going, 
Um, compared to um, an operator that's working in a specific country, um, a partner that we work with, they're seeing 25 to 75% faster growth of Wikipedia usage over the six months when we launch. So here's a couple of our newest um, case studies. And if you look at Niger, for example, um, once we start launching, you can see that growth starts to take off. A lot of it has to do with awareness and marketing and so forth, and probably word of mouth. But these programs basically are spurring um, more usage in a lot of these countries where um, the original kind of usage was a little more flat. And then when you compare it to our overall global mobile usage, we have bigger spikes. And then here's another case study in Ivory Coast. Now this is only over four months, but you can see that in this case, the um, page view growth was even much more rampant. Um, what we're seeing is that maybe, you know, we're still trying to do a lot more research, but I think the more that word gets out about this program, every time we do another launch, we are seeing to see these jumps be like faster and more people getting on board using the free service quicker. So, Every time we do, this is a cumulative um, summary. And right now when Eric talked about you know, our page view growth, we're trying to aim for 200 million page views by the end of June. We're probably not going to get there. But we've learned a lot um, of how we can actually accelerate this. And right now we're about getting to 3.5 million page views. But we think we can get to 10 times that number over the next six months. And if you see, like every time we do a launch, you know, there's a big jump. And I think we'll see some really huge changes with some of the launches that are coming up. So if you look at Vimplecom, when we go to Russia, um, that'll give us access to 50 to 60 million new customers. And that launch alone is bigger, gives us more access to all of the other launches we've done combined. So one of the big things we've been working on is to make sure this, this data is more accessible to the public and to community members. We want everybody to be part of this movement and to evangelize and be able to you know, put this information together. We want to kind of you know, aggregate stuff by, by country, by region, so people can know what the growth is in their areas. Um, it takes a little time to download, but what we're going to do is start putting more and more of this information so the data is publicly available in real time and people know what's happening in their regions. We can kind of skip this if it doesn't load. GP dev? Well, we got this. We'll, we'll, we'll post the, the numbers, but you can see like every time we do a launch, we'll see more spikes, and we're going to start adding in more data in terms of like you know um, getting a little more granular, so people can see what's happening. So can you just explain briefly the difference between the orange line here and the gray greenish line? Right. So this is actually both zero and M dot. So I explained before, zero is a text-only version of the site, and M dot you know basically is the mobile site. So with zero dot. Um, there needs to be a little more marketing involved because people need to know that, that the URL is available. And there are some benefits, um, obviously, to zero because if you're in certain regions of the world, um, it's, we don't really experience that problem here unless you're on AT&T sometimes. But um, <laughs> it's hard, actually, for people to download you know, web, web pages on their mobile device. So this is the, the text-only version that you can also just call up. And people just don't know that it exists. So the page views on that one are ridiculously small. Yeah, so yeah, the, just so what we're seeing, I, like kind of the, the data that we're seeing right now. So let's say in the Western world, like if people have you know, mobile plans, you know, the average page, page views per month is about 25. Um, we estimated that we would probably get half of that in the developing world. And it, it was a complete guess. Um, so we, we went for less than half. We said, OK, let's, we think maybe it's possibly 12. What we're actually seeing is seven on the mobile site when this is why But I mean, we're still seeing some growth. With, with zero dot, we're seeing four. So about four pages. Um, remember, this is kind of starting off, but you know, we're learning a lot in terms of what's needed. And I'll go to some of the slides later, but you know, the markets are a little bit different than we thought, and so is the user behavior. So we're going to start making adjust, adjustments over the few, next few months to make sure that we have the relevant experience for people in developing countries. Is there oh. more? This is, okay, next slide. Hmm? This is not a slide. Do we have anything else? Yeah, a few more slides. Okay, let's pull it up. There we go. 
So this is a still version of what you just saw, because I wasn't sure if we could access it. So let's move on to this one. So I think this is actually really important. It's kind of taken a few months for us to kind of get momentum and awareness. But the, the way this program is going to be successful is that if everybody is a part of it. And we're starting to see different things where this is a really amazing story. And this just happened last month, where a bunch of students in South Africa, um, and from what I heard, actually heard about our program. And they're saying, why can't we get free access to Wikipedia as well? So what they did is they actually lobbied their mobile provider and said, we need access to free Wikipedia so we could do our homework. And basically, they agreed. Um, right now, they give them a few hours every month. We obviously want to be that free to be all the time. But what you're seeing that is a grassroots movement now. I mean, this is really important because the more people that are demanding free knowledge, it makes our, our job easier. And then they're also going to be eventually involved in the community. And for us, to, for us for this to be sustainable, it has to come from the people. And the fact that we're seeing this, we want to give them more tools, more things where they can go out and evangelize on their own. And so this is actually really interesting as well. We're seeing um, interest coming top down. I mean, our whole strategy was to focus on the biggest partners out there, carriers that have 50, 100, 200 million customers that we can access. But we're starting to get a lot of inbound inquiries from telecoms all over the world because they want to be part of this program. And I just got this email two days ago, which I think is just really fascinating, but it's from East Timor. And they basically said, we recently observed that Wikimedia Foundation plans on launching a Wikipedia Zero service in partnership with a telecommunication operator, Vimplecom. It is quite astonishing to provide mobile clients with free data access to such a pool of knowledge like Wikipedia. We do think it would have a positive impact in East Timor, an emergent country which is increasingly connected to the World Wide Web and thus moving forward in the difficult path of development. Please respond to us so we can see the viability of such venture in East Timor. So this is really, really encouraging. This makes our work a lot easier. I think with all the momentum, it's coming from all different sides, that people really want to be part of this free knowledge movement. And we just recently got recognition from a couple of foundations, and this is kind of a, um, a lot of foundations involved with this program. But we just, you probably are all aware, we won the Night News Challenge. And I want to give a lot of credit to the fundraising team, Lisa, um, Renee, Jonathan, Sarah, who actually went to Zimbabwe to promote this for us. And they're giving us $600,000 over two years. Um, we're one of the big winners of the African News Innovation Challenge. And what this means is that people recognize this is a lot of hard work to really reach these people. And they want to support us, speed up our software development and, and our programs and making sure that we can access all the people that need to have free knowledge. So this is one of the interesting things that we found out where we've got to make some adjustments in our program. Now, when I went back to that number, 330 million people have access to, we have access to for Wikipedia Zero. However, if you look at Africa, people that actually have a mobile plan, um, only 11.7% actually have the mobile internet. So that means they might have a phone, but they're actually not using data for various reasons. So if you look at India, like let's say, I think the number, this is from a GSMA study, 875 million people have access to mobile plans. Um, about 90 million of those actually use data. So if we get access to 90 million people you know, through a partnership, we're probably only really getting access to 9 million through data. And you know, India is the same way. It's even lower. So doing zero alone is not going to reach all these people because they are not using the mobile internet to get information. So this is the new program that we're running out. We actually have a prototype ready. We plan to launch it in the next couple months. Dan's been doing a lot of work on this, and we're partnering with the Prekelt Foundation. I have to say Ops and you know, our mobile team has really done a lot of work to prototype this. And we have a lot to learn. But even when we talk to a lot of different partners out there, it's like we have to have this available. People get their information really by USSD and SMS in a lot of these countries. So what we want to do is reach them first, bring them into the community, and hopefully you know, they'll start using Xero and then be contributors. So these are some of the things we've learned. I've kind of touched on some of these points already. But there are a lot of moving parts to make this work. I mean, there are legal issues. We have a lot of marketing. We have to work with these partners. We have to integrate with our ops team. So we've started to actually figure out how that model works. Um, these are a lot of the challenges we have to deal with with the people we're trying to reach. 
And people still see data as expensive. The prices are dropping dramatically. But you know, for some people, it's still something that the, the rich people use because you know it's still a percentage. You know, it can be upwards of 10% of their income. Now, this program obviously is to make sure that this isn't an issue, but we still need to increase awareness about it. The other thing is Wikipedia as a brand doesn't really drive much action to um, to use it. Like it doesn't have the brand recognition that we are kind of accustomed with when people say, oh, you go to Wikipedia, you can find all the information there. Um, it's still a Facebook world. So we've got a lot to do by working with partners, working with community members to make to make people aware that, you know, how do you use Wikipedia and what is the benefit for you? This is another thing we're also learning is that we need to have more local content. So this is, you know, from the contributor side, and I know that the mobile engineering team is doing a lot of work there. And this is not something we can do directly, but we're hoping that more people that we reach to this, they'll start joining the community and start contributing in their local languages. And like I said, with all of this put together, it takes time to build awareness and growth. And with the growth, once we start launching these programs, we're starting to see jumps. And we need to figure out ways to sustain this growth. And I think really a lot of this is really built around building a good awareness program. So these are the things that we're going to start doing over the next few months. We're going to have more delivery options. USSD SMS is one of them. The other thing people aren't really aware about, probably especially if you spend most of your time dealing with smartphones, is that 80% of the world still uses feature phones. And that's you know S40, old Nokia phones. And we have a J2ME app that's already prototyped that we want to launch for people that don't have really good web-enabled um, browsers on their phones. The other thing is we need to do a little more user research and feature improvement. So when we do stuff like launching USSD, and Howie and I had a brief conversation about this, is that you know what's the best user experience that nobody really knows. Nobody's done long form information in SMS. You know, people usually at cricket scores, um, soccer scores, like you know, small bits of cooking recipes. So this is something we have to figure out over time to make sure when we deliver the information, it's in the relevant form for them. This is what I already touched upon, and we want to create some programs where we have materials for community members and like the kids in South Africa, where they can go out and then lobby, have materials where they can campaign and get their providers you know, to push for free access. And we're going to do that by you know, getting a couple more people on board and create a program where there's going to be different levels of like saying, hey, if you want to join this movement, this is how you be part of it, whether you're a telecom, you're you know, a kid you know, at a school, or you're just you know, somebody that uses the internet and you want to be able to like you know, activate other people to join and tweet and, you know, get on any type of social media that's going to talk about this and make sure that people are aware that Wikipedia is a knowledge source for everybody in the developing world to be a part of as well. So that's our plan next few months going forward. I know it's a lot on our table, but we're hoping to come back and show you some of the work that we're doing and see the results and get a little more feedback on how we can improve it. Great. Any questions? Questions for Cool about Wikipedia Zero? Hello. All right. All right. Thank you, Cool. So, Eric, can you raise the screen, please? I'm sorry? Can you raise the screen, please? Sure. I think so. <laughs> they are. They, they, they are. They're, they're very creepy. So, <laughs> not above a slight creep factor. Um, there's cake and lunch, so you guys should all help yourselves. Yay. Thanks all. And if you stick around, we're also going to try to show the video that Mariana wanted to show of John Robson's photo expedition. So.